Hi, and welcome to the Macro Show. We talk macro and try to make sense of markets that, look, look does it really matter what the markets do? As long as bonds are up, right? It's all that matters, am I right? As long as bonds are up, market makes perfect sense. Who cares about what the rest of it does? I'm your host, Steve Van Meter. Thanks for joining me today. If we got a lot going on, first off, special edition of the Macro Show tomorrow, you ask for more educational content, you've got it a whole video on how the Fed has trapped us in a liquidity trap that's going to lead to, yep, lower treasury yields, yay for the bond kingdom, and not only that, lower consumer prices. Yeah, some of you have been asking a lot about this money supply relationship. How can it be answered tomorrow, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, whatever the time zone you're in, there it is. All right, in today's show, we've got the conundrum from Friday. Now, if you missed Friday's show, you'll know that I did not have an answer to what's going on with the pandemic unemployment claims. Leave it to our friend Jeff Snyder to literally post the answer. I think within an hour after the video went up, I swear I had nothing to do with that, but uh, he posted the answer. We'll look at that. We're talking about margin debt and why that is a huge problem. Got some economic data to look over the Chicago Fed National Activity Index, today's 20-year bond auction, what's going on in Germany, and of course, commitment to traders report as always on Monday, I like to look at how the speculators are positioned. So what, let's go back to the real short on Friday. The, there's, there's two things about Friday uh, that bothered me. One, and, and I appreciate a lot of the, the feedback all of you gave me was awesome. And I need to answer on that. So there's two things that bother me. One we'll, we'll need to get to probably in another episode, probably on a Thursday, because we have back to back 900 plus thousand claims. And I'm really curious to see what this is going to be on this coming Thursday. But the conundrum was, why do we see this massive drop off in pandemic unemployment claims? Now, many of you said, Oh, it, part of the problem is, you know, because people were going off the benefit and now they're coming back on, or I mean, they really never left, but because it was allowed to expire, there's there's a lag in the state reporting. And, and your answer was, don't worry, it's, it's going to, it's coming back up. It, it'll, it'll show up. Yeah, that's, that's pretty valid view. And that, and we'll add that on to what Jeff Snyder had to say. Now, this isn't from his article, but he linked to this and I thought this was great. Uh, this is uh, titled, Millions of Workers Will Have to Submit New Documents for Pandemic Unemployment Benefits in 2021. And this, I, I wish I would have seen this one sooner because I thought it was really interesting. Uh, what happened is the $900 billion stimulus bill added new verification process to curb the fraud that impact 10 million people drawing from the program as well as new applicants. Now, I did not know that you could just file it and get these benefits without doing anything. Uh, so let's see, individuals, uh, at the moment the, law, the, the new stimulus bill was passed, individuals currently claiming PUA benefits have 90 days to submit documents proving their eligibility for the program. Mind you, you apparently you did not have to do this before. Failure to do so puts them at risk of having the PUA funds provi uh, provided, or having to return the funds provided after the bill's enactment. Now, obviously, if you are fraudulently claiming, this will be a problem because if you can't prove it, you're going to have to give the money back. Uh, now, this goes on to say that they don't know what all the questions, at the time of this article, what the verification process is, uh, but they're mainly targeting uh, some people like such as who are self-employed freelance or gig workers, and they're going to have to provide some additional information to why it is that they need this money. And so in the past, this is what I find most interesting, and I imagine some of you will too, is when this was originally established, people could self-attest that they were eligible for the POA. Gee, shocking that there was fraud, right? In other words, they swore under a threat of perjury that if they qualified for the aid and a new requirement is unclear how, say, someone whose job offer was rescinded back in April and is yet to find work will prove that they should remain eligible for POA in the new year. Will they have to dig up an old email? Who knows? But nevertheless, the answer to all of this question is that this this new verification process and they will have people who apply for PUA the first time starting January 31st will have 21 days to submit their verification process. Now, does it start to make some sense of why uh, if apparently up they, they believe 10 million people on this program are on it fraudulently, that why they are dropping their claims because, well, 
not eligible for it. So there you go. You got 21 days to prove you're eligible. If you can't, give the money back. So if you're not eligible, that it really does make a whole lot of sense. And it would be interesting to see how this plays out. If the number does go back up because the claims are valid or if it'll go down. Not, and we know they're not getting jobs because, you know, this, the state claims tell us. I mean, if, if the economy was really turning around and people are going back to work, then these wouldn't have back-to-back 900,000-week uh, claims. So let's talk about margin debt. And this is from the Advisor Perspectives website. You can look this article up. They update it uh, usually about once a month uh, as the data comes out. And this shows margin debt. Now, what is margin debt? It's people borrowing either from the dealer or pledging their, sec- their securities uh, for adi- to get additional money. Uh, they're borrowing against their account. And what you can see is that, uh, let's see, where's, is that the chart? Uh, here, Fender margin debt and the S&P 500, you can see margin debt is now all time highs. This is what's driving the market is speculative investing, people borrowing money and buying stocks in the middle of the largest pandemic uh, since the Spanish flu and in the middle of a recession on the hopes that stock prices will go higher regardless of what the economy is going to go through. So this isn't stocks, you know, people like to say, well, well, stocks are forward looking. You know, as uh, one of my friends uh, who's been a longtime veteran in the industry says, man, I remember when that was six months. Now people are saying, oh, stocks are forward looking by 18 months. Uh, no, investors are just hoping stocks are forward looking by 18 months and they're willing to take massive speculative bets against that. If stocks were indeed for looking by 18 months, then all the people that were in stocks going into the March meltdown of last year would have sold ahead of time, and they didn't. So what you see is just massive amounts of speculation in this market, and history shows that eventually speculation, uh, when the markets, when there is a liquidity or insolvency event, that there's a massive unwind of all of this debt, and that is a huge red flag when you see this happening uh, with what's going on, especially when there's 900,000 back-to-back claims. I mean, that's not what we should be seeing right now in terms of an economic recovery. Let's take a look at the economic data. Not a lot to look at today, but there's a little bit. Uh, we've, we've got German business expectations. And we're going to take a little bit deeper look at this. We normally don't. Uh, we I normally just comment about it. But I want to look at, at this because you know, Germany is a manufacturing you know machine of Europe. I mean, that, they are big. So what's going on in, in Germany kind of tells us what potentially is going on in other parts of the country. I mean, right, you've got the German auto manufacturers, uh, you know, big ones there. So you've got current assessment and expectations. Now, current assessments are saying, hey, things are not good. And they're starting to roll over. In fact, they never recovered back to their pre-pandemic levels, never got back up there. But look at expectations. Expectations are like, oh, things are going to get awesome. And they're getting even better. And all of a sudden, expectations are falling. So what you're seeing in Germany is this notion of a recovery. Well, we're not seeing it there uh, in this data at all. Let's go on to look at the, where is it? Chicago Fed National Activity Index. Now, this is a, a great report. Comes out once a month. And as you know, we like to look at this. And you can find it on the Chicago Fed website. And it tells us some pretty interesting things. It says, when the CFNAI is above zero. It shows that the national economy is expanding uh, above its historical trend. Now, you have to take this almost with a slight grain of salt because we went so far below trend. I kind of zoomed in here so you could see that, that yes, it would be logical that we would have above trend growth for a while. The key is where is this thing going? And you can kind of see uh, that it came has come way back down and it's flatlining. Now, even the Chicago Fed says, don't use the month-to-month data. Now, the, the month-to-month data says, hey, it got better. It went from 0.31 to 0.52, and that's pretty good. And they said, no, nah, you can't really use that because it's a pretty volatile index. They said, you need to use a three-month moving average of it, and it shows pretty clear this thing is flattening out. Now, the good news is it is above trend growth. The problem is it's flat, and that's not what you want to see when people are talking about reflation and the economy rebounding to pre-pandemic levels because this thing is likely to head lower. Now, in terms of inflation, because everybody thinks inflation is coming, 
uh, it says that you would need to see an, a likelihood of a period sustained increasing inflation has historically been associated with values of the CFNAI uh, three-month moving average above 0 0.7. Where is the three-month moving average? 0 0.61. Where was it before? 0 0.59, the 0 0.86. So the three-month moving average is below anything that would indicate inflation and it's got to be during a period of economic expansion and two years. Well, we're not. So we had today's two-year treasury auction. Uh, normally, we don't look at the two-year, but this was a great auction. Uh, it went off very well. One thing that's really interesting to me is the primary dealers took down a little over $16.5 billion, and the Fed is buying about $25.5 billion of two years per month. So, you, you know, the Fed is gobbling up more than the dealers are getting. And when we've talked about the yield curve, right, and what we want to see is downward pressure on two-year yields, and then on the long end, 10s or 30s would be great. Uh, this indicates that the likelihood that two-year yields are going lower is increasing. This, this is a good sign for the uh, flattening of the yield curve. And of course, you know, the first phase of my thesis uh, winding up to the end and playing out as I thought. Uh, let's take a look at the commitment of traders report. This coming in from a friend, uh, Brent Johnson of Santiago Capital. Uh, shorts increased by 2,500, a little 2,500 uh, contracts, not much to the net position of uh, negative 199,000, which is still, well, uh, amazingly large. I mean, yeah, it's not the worst, uh, the lowest in history, but it is really, really high, or really, really low here. And that is likely to lead to a massive speculative unwind, which as many of you know, uh, when the CTAs trigger back in their buying, uh, these speculators are not going to be able to stop that volume of buying. And it looks like today, we'll get to the charts, the buying pressures are done. Let's take a look at the broader report from Hedge Opia. Uh, we see that after going to uh, a net short position on 10 years, large specs are back along the 10 year. Uh, so they had a quick change in mind about that, but they, as we just saw, they had no change in their view on the 30 year deepening their short position. I mean, this, it, it's interesting. You see people that are going after um, companies like GameStop and AMC and shorting or, or, or buying or taking long speculative long positions to bid out the shorts. I wonder what'll happen the day they figure out they could do the same thing in the bond market. How about uh, crude oil futures on West Texas Intermediate? No real change there. Uh, we keep seeing uh, product builds, and last week we saw a little bit of a supply build. So this is a continued theme every week is what's going on with the oil market. We'll see if what, I'll be curious to see what's, what that says on Wednesday, and we'll of course talk about it on that show. How about the uh, S&P 500? They are pretty much net, neutral right now on the S&P 500, uh, getting squeezed out of some of their short positions. How about the euro? Increase in the euro would put downward pressure on the dollar, potentially upward pressure on gold. So we see a little bit longer position on the euro. Everyone thinks that QE is money printing. It is not, but everyone thinks it is. Uh, how about gold futures unchanged? So no, no change there. The NASDAQ, uh, slight, well, somewhat increase in their long positions. People continue to bet on higher tech stocks. And the Russell 2000, we see they went to, uh, wow, they pretty much dropped all of their positions and went net neutral uh, to a mere 449,000. And I guess they think that uh, small caps are done, even though that's probably the most one of the most crowded trades on the market now. How about the US dollar massive short? We've seen in the past when speculators are deeply short the dollar, along all the other currencies, there's an unwind coming, which I believe will be led by the bond market. And here's one thing that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, is speculators are increasing their short volatility positions, believing that nothing bad can happen to the U.S. stock market. Of course, as we know, uh, when the bond market does unwind, it will pull all that liquidity out. Let's take a look at some of uh, a couple of quick charts. Uh, we have TLT reversing here, gapping up overnight trading, and then a solid day. When you see a candlestick like this, where the where it opens and then closes pretty much right at the high, I mean that is a strong showing in the bond market. So potentially a gap up higher tomorrow night. We'll see what happens uh, tomorrow. 
And what, what am I watching? I'm really interested in GDX, as I mentioned on uh, the Sunday, uh, Sunday night chart show. I'm really interested to see further rejection here at the 50 day moving average. What I'm, what I'm looking for to see either potential liquidity or insolvency crisis is GDX down and TLT up. Now remember they do have a longstanding relationship. So it's possible TLT rising could also pull gold mining stocks higher, but if gold mining stocks can't rally with it, then that is an ominous sign to me. Uh, what else do we have maybe of interest? How about emerging markets still sitting near, um, uh, is it at all time? I can't remember, we at all, yep, at all time highs. You think if there's something set for a reversal, that might be one of those, especially if GDX goes down, that would be your indicator. So uh, I'm Steve Van Meter. As always, appreciate you being fans. Appreciate your feedback. Thanks for all the likes. Thanks for the subscribes. Check out tomorrow's show. It's uh, it's it's going to be great. I, I got the whole report from the St. Louis Fed linked in there. We're going to go through it step by step. It What it does is it validates everything I've been teaching you. Tells you exactly how this is going to play out, courtesy of the Fed. And of course, that's, uh, you know, when you, when you understand how the markets work, then you start to understand how what I did is I built my thesis around exactly how the system works. And because it's a macro thesis, it takes a little longer to play out. Uh, but for those of you who are Real Vision fans, uh, make sure you tune in tomorrow. I, I interviewed the new president and big fan of the show. He's laughing right now. Travis Kimmel at Colorado Travis on Twitter. Check it out where we talk about the greatest trade. That's right, because uh, you know when you understand how macro thesis play out, when you understand how the system works, you know how all this is going to go, and you know what to do. It's just a matter of being there at the right time and having the the capital to do it, which most people don't at, at major market bottoms. Again, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. We'll see you tomorrow for the special, and then back for a regular macro show on Wednesday. Bye now. The content of this video is provides educational information only is not intended to provide investment or other advice. Drills not to be construed as recognition or solicitation by our social security financial instrument or participate in any particular training strategy. So what's bear by Steam Van Meter or personal capacity, opinions expressed this video that do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advising or Steam Van Meter Financial.